Do you feel like you get sick often? I don't. I feel like I did as a child, but I feel like I don't get sick very often at all now. So what do you think you're doing different now <laughs> than <laughs> when you were a child? Probably I'm no longer in the toxic wasteland that is an elementary <laughs> school. <laughs> What? <laughs> I remember getting strep throat so many times when I Me was too. in elementary school. And then never again. <laughs> I remember my doctor <laughs> saying to me like, Kyle, you've had it four times this year. If you get it again, we're going to have to rip your throat out. <laughs> <laughs> she was so mad at me. And did that get you to stop licking doorknobs? <laughs> I kept licking them all. <laughs> The dustier, the better. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's, <laughs> yep, that's what they call you, Dusty Kyle. Welcome to Butter No Parsnips. Every week on Butter No Parsnips, your hosts Kyle Imperator and Emily Moyers take you on an adventure through the weird, wacky, wonderful, and sometimes even wicked world of one wayside word. Strange characters, delightful bits, and general joyousness abound. Join them as they test each other's etymological expertise. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Butter No Parsnips. I'm Emily Moyers, and I'm here with Dusty Kyle. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Dusty Kyle Imperator, or Kyle Dusty Imperator, <laughs> if you watch my <laughs> wrestling career. Do you have a sick <laughs> word for me today, Kyle? I got a sick word for you, Emily. It's oh. so sick, it's ill. <laughs> That's how Radical. sick it is. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, my word for you today is fomite. F-O-M-I-T-E, fomite. Fomite. Just, I have nothing to go on. <laughs> is this a Latin-based word? Yes, it is. Did it come through something else to English? Nope. Huh. Wow. <laughs> wow it really stumped you there, huh? <laughs> you were like on a roll and then gave you the word and you were like, I am devastated. I'm struck dumb. I am ill now. <laughs> I'm bedridden by this word. What's the part of speech? Is it a noun? It is a noun, yes. Okay. It's a noun, and it's fomite, and I would like a hint. I'll give you two hints. Okay. Can I have one, and then I'll guess? <laughs> sure, sure. Your hint is toilet bowl. Oh. Oh, I don't like any any guesses that I have based mm -hmm. on the hint toilet bowl are mm -hmm. vile. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. And? I mean, <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> say any of them. <laughs> so I say one. Okay. I mean, the first thing that came to mind was like grime in the toilet bowl. <laughs> is <laughs> is fomite. fomite. <laughs> like that, that bacteria that grows there is called fomite. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I think that's called butt algae. <laughs> oh, you made it worse. Thank you. Now I'm better by comparison. <laughs> if it helps you, the original hint that I had written down was doorknob. That's so funny. That's so yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah. But this is a noun? It's a <sighs> noun. It, would you say a fomite? Is it a countable noun? It is a countable noun, Emily. Oh. If this helps you. That does help me. So I'm going to say... A fomite is like just, you know, like a cesspool, like a like a like an environment that garners a lot of bacteria. Emily, you are almost there, so I'm gonna <gasps> give it to you. It is practically yes. it. Nice, nice. job. <laughs> Emily, a fomite is an inanimate object capable of carrying infectious agents and thus passively enabling their transmission between hosts. So a fomite it could be anything. <laughs> Literally any inanimate object can be a fomite. Scary. Yeah, that's why I don't <laughs> study medicine. This whole episode is the reason why I have not gone into medicine, you know? Yeah, yeah. So this is, hey, quick warning. This is going to be a rough one, guys. <laughs> Emily, understatement of the century. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. So fomite can be traced back to a Proto-Indo-European root, which I can't pronounce, but means... <laughs> To burn, warm, or hot. Sure. Like warm places grow a lot of bacteria. Sure. 
That's not how it get, gets there, but I well, like that. I like where you're going. <laughs> Emily, this Proto-Indo-European root, also brought us some other simmering F words. Ooh. Can you, do you think you can name any F words that might be related to fomite here? I don't know. A, a simmering words, you said? Yeah. Could perhaps be <laughs> medicine related or, you know, related to illnesses. Is it related to medicine or related to hot, to, to burning? Both. They're all related, Emily. <laughs> I don't see how. <laughs> I'll show you how. One of okay. them is fever, which oh. comes through the Latin febris. As in febrifacient. <laughs> As in febrifacient, a word which we've covered on a post on our social media. Um, yeah. Another word, Emily, which you may have heard of is the word foment. Have you ever heard of the word foment? I have not. I have heard ferment. Sure. Ferment is different. But f to foment means to incite or cause troublesome acts. Oh. So, yeah, to foment. So you might foment a revolution. That's a really good word. It's a good word. It comes through Latin fomentum meaning a warm application, lotion, or compress, and then was used by extension to mean kindling wood or tinder. And then it was used figuratively to mean a remedy, mitigation, or alleviation. And it comes from the Latin foveo, meaning to warm, to nurture, to encourage, or to assist. Foment. That's a good, that's a good word. It's a good word. But we're not talking about foment, Emily. All right. The Proto-Indo-European root also yielded the Latin fomes, F-O-M-E-S. And it was another word for tinder or kindling. And here is where our story truly begins. <laughs> Strap in, Emily. Put on your N95 masks. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to need them. You're going to need them. I'm going to get in my hazmat suit. <laughs> yeah. So in the 1500s, Emily... Fomes, the Latin word, began to be used by physicians to mean, by extension, a kindling for disease. Oh. Yeah. Like you're starting a disease with the kindling. Yeah, like it's spreading like a fire. That is like a, a, a vivid visual image. <laughs> so that Latin word, Emily, came directly to English as the word fomes. F-O-M-E-S. That one sounds more horrifying than it Fomite. It sounds more, absolutely. It's gross. <laughs> well, and Fomies, for the majority of the last 500 years, was the preferred term for this concept. Fomies was used, not Fomite. Huh. Like, fo like is Fomies singular? Well, Emily, so... You've hit on the crux of the problem <laughs> here. Yes. Fomies is singular. So a, a Fomies refers to just one object. Right. But sometimes in texts, they had to talk about multiple of them, right? So what's the plural yeah. form of Fomies? Just Fomieses? Fom Fomai? Fome? Fom Fom <laughs> the plural of Fomies, Emily, is Fomites. F-O-M-I-T-E-S. That is an insane plural. <laughs> insane plural. Can you see where this is going? Because then, yes, I can, because then it looks like the singular is fomite. Yeah. <laughs> it's fomite. So in the 1800s, fomites was mistaken to be the plural fomites, with the singular being fomite. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, this is what is called a back formation. I can't remember. I'm. We must have talked about back formations we must have, before on the podcast. Because they're one of my favorite ways that words form. It's hilarious. It is hilarious. It happens all the freaking time. Yeah. And uh, because of how recently fomite was formed, it's not until much recently that fomite has become more standard than fomies in English. Google Ngram shows fomite overtaking fomies in usage only as of 2012. Wow. That's this how is, recent this word is. Yeah. This is a 21st century word. <laughs> yeah. But before we get to more modern times, let's talk about the origins of fomites and 
foamies. Okay. It all starts with the man, the myth, the Italian physician, poet, and scholar in mathematics, geography, and astronomy. Uh. Girolamo Fracastoro. <laughs> yes, uh, that that legend that we all know of. <laughs> we all know him. <laughs> Girolamo Fracastoro. Ger- 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 Geronimo what? <laughs> Girolamo Fracastoro. Girolamo Fracastoro. Yeah, I'm going to say it now. like a Long Island Italian. Fracastoro. <laughs> Go down to Fracastoro's and get me two of those rainbow cookies. <laughs> and if you run into Girolamo, tell him. <laughs> <laughs> so Fracastoro is well revered for his many medical and scientific contributions to history. Um, the citizens of Verona, where he was born and practiced, erected a marble statue of him there, and <gasps> not to be outdone, a bronze statue was erected in Padua, where Fracastoro studied and was appointed professor at the age of 19. Wow. <laughs> what era is this? He's a renaissance uh, man. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like he's a renaissance man, but yeah. when did he live, Kyle? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was born in the late 1400s. <laughs> okay. So, Fracastoro dabbled in many realms, Emily. His paper, Divino Temperatura, concerned the constitution of wine. Oh. He mused about the function of the poet in the form of a dialogue, and he advocated a homocentric model of the universe that contrasted with fellow University of Padua graduate Copernicus's heliocentric <gasps> model. All right, so not the most trustworthy guy. <laughs> well, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe nah, astronomy wasn't, right wasn't his time. field. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it sounds like medicine was his field. Yes. His real claim to fame focuses on his work with contagions. Emily, what do you know about epidemics? Oh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not much. I've never really experienced one, mm-hmm. so <laughs> how much can I know, really? You're you're a green thumb when it comes to epidemics. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, what is there? What is there to know? <laughs> They're bad. They're bad. That's for sure. They're bad, and they spread like wildfire from kindling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so epidemics, which come from the ancient Greek epi, meaning upon, and demos, meaning people, oh. are geographically concentrated disease outbreaks, as opposed to yeah. pandemics from the ancient Greek Pan meaning all, which spread across multiple geographical areas. So epidemics are only localized. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much we've adhered to that, you right. know, in general in, speech, but yeah. that's where the etymology comes from, at least for both sure. of them. Wikipedia lists the earliest known epidemic as the 1350 BC plague of Megiddo in Canaan. <gasps> which we know of from clay tablets known as the Amarna letters, containing correspondence between Biridia, mayor of Megiddo, and Amenhotep III, complaining of his land being consumed by death, plague, and dust. Dusty Kyle, <laughs> he was there at the first epidemic. <laughs> it's interesting that like he included dust on his list of and grievances. Also dust. He was like, all of my citizens are dying. Also, there's dust bunnies in here, and that's the bigger problem for me. <laughs> It's just like, of course there's dust. You're in the middle of a desert, dude. <laughs> but uh, Fracastoro c- published his findings on contagions in his 1546 De Contagione et Contagiosis Morbis, or On Contagion and Contagious Diseases. Oof. This was like his big, one of his big claim to fames. Claims sure. to his fame, magnum sorry. Opus. Yes, his his uh, magnum's opus. Yes, <laughs> so I'm. This is a quote from a an article from Scientific American, but it it kind of sums this up. Fracastoro posited that diseases were caused by imperceptible seed like entities, which he called seminaria, 
which could multiply rapidly, propagate quickly, and were unique to each disease. Okay. How do you feel about the seed-like entities, Emily? (laughs) It's not great, but I feel like the metaphor gets the point across. Well, and that metaphor was extended to Fomies. He's the one who brought Fomies into English. So Fracastora was the first to connect three possible means by which these seeds could spread, saying... The first infects by direct contact only. The second does the same, but in addition leaves foamies, and this contagion may be spread by means of that foamies. Thirdly, there is a kind of contagion which is transmitted also at a distance. So, like yeah. through the air. Like airborne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, like these th- concepts like existed, but no one ever put them all together and said, there's a type of thing that is causing all of these. Yeah. <laughs> You know? Yeah, just somebody to connect all the dots. Connect all the foamies. <laughs> and he was writing in Latin and his works got translated to English, or was he writing in English? He was, yeah, I mean, it was 1546 in Renaissance Italy. He was writing in Latin, yeah. <laughs> right. But he, that work was translated into English. And, and right, that's, and that's I why we have we the word. Yeah. He also defines what a foamies could be by saying, by foamies, I mean clothes, wooden objects, and things of that sort, which, though not themselves corrupted, can nevertheless preserve the original germs of the contagion and infect by means of these. Wow. I I didn't think the the Renaissance era understood that. (laughs) That seems like a big concept to understand that like if somebody's sick and then they cough into a handkerchief and you touch that handkerchief, you're going to get sick. (laughs) Emily, yes, it is big. And there's a reason why you didn't think they thought that. And we'll get to that later. Oh, <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> did he did he face a similar fate as Copernicus about it? Or <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> so Fracastoro was also the first to insinuate that these seeds of disease were a separate type of living thing, and Ooh. this is pointed to as an early forerunner of the concept of microorganisms. Yeah. Man, this guy was like on the cutting edge. Yeah, he really was. Emily, Fracastoro's findings were inspired by, of all things, atomism. Wow. Do you remember what atomism is, Emily? I do remember what atomism is. It's basically the idea that atoms exist. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, literally that. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we talked about that in Conjuries. A very cool stuff. That was also like something on the cutting edge that was like, man... It's so far back in time, and you are yeah. positing things that are true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so atomism is a natural philosophy that it dates back to ancient Greece, to uh, Leucippus and Democritus. Yes. Um, and it basically proposed that the universe has two separate components, atoms and not atoms, which void, they called yeah. void. Yeah. I, now, at the time during the Renaissance, the works of the Roman atomist Lucretius were rediscovered. And the similarities between Lucretius's works and Fracastoro's findings are crystal clear, Emily. It clearly of the same cloth. Yeah, it's clear that Fracastoro was reading Lucretius. Gotcha. And influenced by that kind of atomism. So, uh, in his famous philosophical poem, De Rerum Natura, or On the Nature of Things, Lucretius writes this on sickness. He says, Or even, as may be the case, the infection remains suspended in the air itself, and when, as we breathe, we inhale the air mingled with it, we must necessarily absorb those seeds of disease into our body. I love the ancient Greeks who are like, I have something really important about like science or philosophy to say, but I'm going to say it in verse for no reason. I know. (laughs) Why? Why? (laughs) Emily, the ancient ancient Greeks weren't the only ones who did that. Uh, We're going to get to that in a little bit too. (laughs) The scholar Pablo Moret also draws a direct parallel between Lucretianism and Fracastoro's ideas on contagion, specifically with regard to Lucretius's emphasis on tactility or the sense of touch, which is something that 
you know, Lucretius talked about, the perception of touch. How does touch relate to atomism? Do you know? I could like I can see how it factors into contagion because like you touch things and that's what transmits disease. That may not have necessarily been directly tied to atomism. Okay. But just part of Lucretius's philosophy. Okay. I'm not sure though. What I do know is that the scholar Pablo Moret wrote in his 2014 article De Rerum Textura, Lucretius Fracastoro and the Sense of Touch stating both authors, that's Lucretius and Fracastoro, understand touch or tactus as a bodily sense that functions at a perceptible level, but also as an ontological mechanism that glues reality together and operates at an imperceptible atomic or corpuscular level. Uh, it's also something we talked about when uh, we talked about atomism. Something. Wow, yeah. this is yeah. like, like we're talking about the fabric of the universe here. <laughs> well, Emily, let's change course. We're going to talk about a different kind of fabric here. Okay. The fabric kind of fabric. Oh. So, of course, Emily, touch is how fomites spread diseases, right? Yes. I found this great. Great explanation of fomites. <laughs> it's from an 1800 article called On the Perspirable Fluids. Ugh. The author, Dr. Mitchell, daintily relates this to his readers. In this manner, a seaman's chest of dirty clothes tainted with all kinds of animal exudations <sighs> may turn to a foamies. By a process in no wise different, do feather beds and beds of all kinds that have been long laid upon and thereby become thoroughly impregnated with perspirable and other matter, acquire their unwholesome qualities and turn to a foamies. Just thus are clothes charged with perspirable and other excrementitious matter, <laughs> discharged from the bodies of prisoners in jail, converted to venom and pestilence or to an infectious or contagious. Just foamies. <sighs> I understand, like, like sweat is a type of excrement. It is a thing that excretes yeah, from your body. I so I understand I why he's I using know. these words. But it's like you're talking about this in the most horrifying way that you possibly could. It's awful. <laughs> it's just, I mean, he used the word excrementitious, you know? <laughs> Which is like not a real word. <laughs> you're just being flowery now. <laughs> yeah. So many infectious agents can be spread by these fomites, Emily. If you remember yeah. back to 2020, I know you don't want I, to. <laughs> it rings a bell. I think I can recall things that yeah. happened. Thank you. Yeah. Faintly, it's, you know, hazy. <laughs> but COVID was originally thought to be transmitted mainly through fomites. They right. thought that touching things was how, how you would get it. Yeah. When everybody was like sanitizing their groceries because right. they right. thought that was... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we've since learned that it is still possible, but it, the likelihood is very low. Am I right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it like can spread through touch, but it doesn't live long on an inanimate object. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. But it, it, it the risk of airborne transmission is much greater. Yeah. Um, uh, most of our audience probably knows this by now. And if you yeah. don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you want to know more about COVID, <laughs> please listen to Follow the Science with Faye Flam. Yes. I'm not just plugging it because our editor was the editor for that <laughs> podcast, but also because I wrote the theme music for it. <laughs> but also because it's a good podcast, Kyle. <laughs> and that too. Faye Flam is a very intelligent person. Yes. It's a very good podcast. Yeah. So some diseases that actually can be spread through fomites include E. coli, influenza, rhinovirus, cold sores, diarrhea, and hand, <laughs> foot, and mouth disease. That's okay. just a few All of right. them, Emily. <laughs> well, we can stop this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. There's a lot more, Emily. Uh, also, the is the rest of this episode mm -hmm. just you listing diseases? <laughs> <laughs> Basically. So also the distantly related animal disease, foot and mouth disease, <sighs> is spread by fomites. Fracastoro was actually the first to describe this disease. I'm just now realizing... I've heard the phrase foot in mouth disease used yeah, to refer yeah. to someone who's saying something they shouldn't. And I've now yeah. just discovered that that is a pun yeah. on foot mm -hmm. and mouth mm -hmm. disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got it, Em. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's fun. Also spread by fomites, if you can believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I high fived a guy who was a real jerk, and now I can't <laughs> keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I'm just going around saying things. Now I'm mansplaining. <laughs> Fracastoro also studied some contagions spread by other means. Emily, he was the first to describe the disease typhus, which is spread by parasites. And after he became the physician for the Council of Trent in 1545, he convinced the Pope two years later to move the council to Bologna to avoid an epidemic of typhus in Trent. So he Ah. probably saved a lot of their lives by doing so. That's very fun. I was distracted because once you said Council of Trent, I was imagining like a council of people like, named Trent. Bros. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Trentius Maximus, I know you're like the Pope and everything, but uh, are we going to get typhus from this? <laughs> Hell yeah, brah. Typhus is my BF. <laughs> Your BF? What? BFF is what I meant to say. But you know what? Maybe it was. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they were really, you know, progressive in the I'm Council of Trent. Nobody named Trent has ever used the phrase BF. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lastly, Emily, what do you know about syphilis? Oh, <laughs> when will it end? <laughs> I know exactly as much as I want to know about syphilis, Kyle, so you're not allowed to tell me anymore. (laughs) Then close your ears for the next six to eight minutes. So syphilis, as all of our audience definitely knows, (laughs) is an infection which can rarely be transmitted through fomites. But since the bacteria, like COVID, can't last long outside the body, it's primarily transmitted, unlike COVID, through sexual intercourse. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Talk about foot in mouth disease, am I right? Oh, 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 gross, Kyle. Bring that one back. We haven't played that soundbite in a while, but you deserve it. (laughs) So we don't exactly know how syphilis started, but the first documented major European outbreak occurred in 1495 when French troops invaded Italy during the First Italian War, and it possibly led to nearly 5 million deaths during the Renaissance yeah. period. Yeah. Cislo- it was like a big really problem then. then. Yeah. It was huge. The strains of syphilis that people can get today are not nearly as destructive as the original strain. Yeah, so like that older strain, was that transmitted in other ways or were no. like they all just having mad sex? <laughs> uh, yeah, actually it's one of the first sexually transmitted diseases that was from the get-go known as a disease of sex. <sighs> And so there was a lot, there was like, if you were known to have syphilis, it was like, oh, you're a sinner, you know? (laughs) Wow. So people didn't want to admit that they were sick, (laughs) which is also part of that problem, you know? Sure, 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 sure. I guess I had heard that it was like such a big problem and had like such a high death toll that I assumed like it must have spread in other ways then. (laughs) Nope. Just by sex. Wow. That's uh, crazy. So, as a part of his study of this as-of-yet unnamed infection, in 1530, Fracastoro published Syphilis Sive Morbus Gallicus, or Syphilis, or the French disease, which is what it was known as before he had published this, because the French had given all of the Italians the disease. Right. The French actually called it the Italian disease for <laughs> the opposite reason. So, you know, it is what it is. But so Fracastoro published this epic poem in three parts. And the poem tells of a shepherd named Sipilus who insults the sun god and is thus punished with a horrible disease. And it says, And after him this malady we call syphilis, tearing at our city's wall, to bring with it such ruin and such a rack that even the king escaped not its attack. Wow. So, Fracastoro, in this poem, is the first to name the disease as syphilis, because he came up with a character named Sipilus and then <laughs> named the disease after this character. Oh, oh, okay. I, sorry. I thought you said he had pulled that from an existing story. He made no. up a story? He wrote this. 
He made this up. The disease was not named until he wrote this story. That's Remember, wild. 1495 was when the first outbreak occurred, and he wrote this in 1530. And this wow. was his study, his scientific <laughs> study of syphilis in poem form. In poem form and story time form. And story time form. <laughs> what a wild way. Yeah. Not only was Fracastoro the first to name the disease, he was also the first to propose a treatment, which he does in this poem, saying, oh. All men concede that mercury's the best yeah. of agents that will cure a tainted <laughs> breast. <laughs> You know, I mean, it will, <laughs> it will eliminate the problem of the disease. And yeah. while it's at it, it will eliminate your yep, life. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It'll kill everything that's in you. <laughs> it is, you know, it's powerful, that stuff. Ooh. <laughs> Effective. So this work, Emily, was Yee. so popular, probably because everyone had syphilis at the time. <laughs> that he only officially published it in 1530 because he had previously released a manuscript edition in 1521 that was handwritten. And he was afraid that hand copying of this manuscript edition would lead to too many errors. <laughs> sure. So he was like, I'm just going to like type something up and send it out to the masses so that it's yeah. not wrong, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, wise. If we're talking yeah. about infectious Truly. disease, Truly. you want to make sure that it's right. You yeah, want to make exactly. sure that you follow the science. <laughs> yeah. And his work on syphilis was so popular at the time that it's even been speculated that a painting of him, which has recently been reattributed to the Renaissance painter Titian, was actually painted in exchange for one of his renowned syphilis treatments. <laughs> <laughs> he said, if you hook me up with some mercury, I'll paint you. <laughs> and he said, okay, paint me before I give you the mercury, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen after. Honestly, I don't know. I don't know which one is the better outcome here. <laughs> so, Emily, Fracastoro's theory on the seeds of disease. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is what I was leading up to this entire time. Okay. It wasn't widely accepted at the time that he published his work. Uh huh. So they liked his syphilis treatment, but not yes. <laughs> his other ideas. Yes. yes. <laughs> but... It did gain a lot of notoriety in the late 1800s and early 1900s when scientists took a look back at it, and it's generally seen as the precursor and the influence for our modern day germ theory. Got you. So it was a it was a sleeper hit. A sleeper it hit. It came back around, you know. It was a box office bomb, but <laughs> But but a cult favorite later. Yeah, cult <laughs> classic. Uh, but Emily, I think that here on BNP, we will remember Fracastoro for that funny little word that he brought us. Whatever you call it, foamies, fomities, fomites, you just remember at home that Fracastoro found it first. And also to wash your hands. Those are the two things that you should remember. Yes, those are the two most important things. <laughs> Emily, that's fomite. Really fun episode, Kyle. That was a good journey. Good deep dive you let us on. Well, Emily, can you use fomite in a sentence? Yeah, just it won't be a pleasant one. <laughs> Absolutely true. <laughs> All right. Kyle had a big problem with strep throat when he was in elementary school yes, 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 because yes. he kept putting his mouth on fomites. All around him. Literally true. Yep. I just <laughs> liked, I, there was a thing with putting things in my mouth. I just liked it, you know? We are going to isolate that audio and uh, <laughs> use that against you. <laughs> I'm going to use that for me, you know? <gasps> I'm going to put that on my hinge profile. <gasps> Emily, you ready to play a game? Yeah, let's play a game. So, Emily, the term back formation... Yeah. Was coined by OED editor James Murray in 1889. Wow. That makes sense. But fomite isn't the only famous back formation in the English language. So your game today is called Foamies Homies. <laughs> I will give you groups of three words, and you're going to have to tell me which one of them was created as a back formation. Love this. Okay. First group of words are berry, bean, and pea. Which P? 
P E A P. I will say, ooh, that's hard. I will say bean. Bean? But it's an absolute guess. It's a wrong guess, Emily. That's all right. The answer is P. Oh, I almost, that was my first instinct, and I then know. I second guessed myself. It comes from the Middle English singular peas, P E A S E, the plural of which was peasen. <laughs> Like peas and carrots. <laughs> like peas and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's is was that like the same thing as fomities? Like they thought it was a plural. Yep, literally mm-hmm. thought it was a plural. Changed it to p. Fun. All right, Emily. Here's your next one. Chupacabra, <gasps> Yeti, Jackalope. Oh my gosh. Okay. I mean, it can't be Jackalope because that's like a, a a portmanteau, isn't it? Okay. I will say Yeti. Emily, you're. A- O for two. (laughs) The answer is chupacabra. Wow. What is that back form from? It comes from the Spanish chupacabras from chupa, meaning it sucks, and cabras, (laughs) meaning goats. Oh, because it sucks the blood of goats? Literally. But the word was chupacabras, so it was a chupacabras. It sucks goats, you know? Yeah. And uh, in English, we're like, oh, (laughs) they're (laughs) talking about all these chupacabras. (laughs) Wow. All right, last one, Emily. All right. Your options are flab, flake, as in an unreliable person, and funk, as in the style of music. Oh, didn't we talk about funk somewhere? No, funk... Funk was like a ghost word, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to say that it's flake because I can see that coming from a phrase. Emily, you're correct. Flake is a back formation. And the reason why you're correct is because all three of those were back formations. (laughs) (laughs) Flab is a back formation from flabby. Sure. Flake is a back formation from flaky. And funk, and funk is a, oh, it's a back formation from funky. That's right. We did talk yeah. about that in Ghost Words, but... We, uh, I, yes, I think we yeah, did. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we discovered that it wasn't one. <laughs> that was a fun game, though, Kyle. I, I feel oh, no you, shame about getting those wrong because they were fun anyway. I'm glad you had a good time. <laughs> I had a good time. And I hope all of you at home had a good time. I hope that you all had a good time, and I hope that you remember that you can find Butter No Parsnips on social media, on Facebook and Instagram at Butter No Parsnips Podcast, and on TikTok at Butter No Parsnips. And if you like today's episode, consider giving us a five-star rating or review wherever you heard us. And if you really like today's episode, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash Butter No Parsnips. Donating $5 or more earns you a shout-out, either on social media or here on the podcast. Thanks so much to all of you. You help us make what we make. And with that, I've been Kyle Imperator. And I've been Emily Moyers, and this has been Butter No Parsnips. Butter No Parsnips is produced by Seth Glicksman, Emily Moyers, and myself, Kyle Imperator. The main and accompanying themes were composed by Kyle Imperator.